Shalom, and welcome to the Yahushua Rose channel here on YouTube. My name is Daniel, and in today's video I'd like to take a look at the concept and word, word. The word that we find in John chapter 1, uh, in the prologue of John, in this video here that I've done, uh, John 1, 1 to 14, I attempted to explain that, and I also went through Revelation 19, 13 in these three videos, and attempted to explain there. Now, I know that I'm not the best communicator in the world, but that's what today's video is going to be about, communication, because that's really in effect what this word means, uh, logos, and we will take a look at that further right now. All right, so on the screen in front of us is the concordance page for the word logos the greek word logos which is strong's g0356 g3056 and we looked at this in the john 1 1 to 14 video but let's go over it again because it's important in communicating in communication to understand terms and in the art of language words are the medium of, of communication and in order for us to communicate together we must understand or come from the same understanding of what those words mean so in other words if i understand that logos means one thing and you understand it to mean another then we are never going to communicate because we have differing ideas of what this word means now some words have variant meanings uh, but this is usually spelled out in a concordance or a dictionary, and it's easy to clarify, and usually the context will determine which uh, inflection of that word is being used. So when we look at the word logos here in the outline of biblical usage in the concordance, we see that it is of speech. But it is more than of speech, as we'll see. Uh, the subcategory here, A, says a word uttered by a living voice it embodies a conception or idea. So it's not just a word. It is a word that expresses or embodies a, con a conception or an idea. The sayings of God. Decree, mandate, or order. The moral precepts given by God. The Old Testament prophecy given by the prophets. Very important. What is declared? A thought, a declaration, aphorism, aphorism a weighty saying, a dictum, a, mass, a maxim, discourse, the act of spe speaking, speech. Here's a good one here. Doctrine. Doctrine. So when we read John 1.1, 1, 1, we see that, let me go back to it here, with my slow computer. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Logos. Geo356. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. So here we have a definition of the Logos. The Logos is God. But is there only one Logos? No, there's more than one Logos. The Logos of God is God. But there are other meanings or other applications of the word logos. So if we scroll down to every entry in which the word logos is used in the New Testament, starting in Matthew 5.32 is the first time this comes up. Uh, Jesus speaking uh, in the Mount of All uh, in the Beatitudes says, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the logos of fornication, Translated in English as the cause in this case. Saving for the cause of fornication causeth her to be commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced commits adultery. Committeth adultery. So the logos of, a, of fornication. This is part of the logos of God. The doctrine of God. It is found in the law of God. But in the very next entry in Matthew 5.37 we see, But let your communication or let your logos be yea yea nay nay for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil so each of us also have a logos 
Now, John 1.1 1, 1 is obviously speaking of God's Logos, the Logos of God, the Word of God. But we see right here that the Messiah uh, communicates to us that we have a communication or a Logos. So a Logos is um, in the Bible specified to God, but there are times when uh, there are other Logoses. You see that... Uh, here in the next entry, in Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever heareth these sayings, these logoses of mine. Now, this is Jesus' logos, but of course we'll, we'll find later that he says that his, the logos is not his, but him that sent him. And so we see it's a uh, logos is uh, translated or translated in English in many different forms as the word, as sayings, as communication as word. Now let's scroll back up for a second to the um, to this entry here, Strong's definition, and it says uh, Logos is, is from the root G3004, something said, including the thought, by implication a topic, a subject of discourse, also reasoning, the mental faculty or motive, by extension, a computation specialty. Uh, the divine expression, i.e. Christ. The Christ being the anointing, or the anointed. Concerning doctrine, fame. So, and then we can go down here, and it says uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon. Let's read what uh, this has to say here. Logos, and a couple other forms of it, from Homer on down. The Septuagint, especially for this Hebrew word, which I believe here would be Davar, also for a couple of variants of that, where the word is um, translated in English from these Hebrew words, it properly a collecting collection, the word of God, and that as well as those things which are put together in thought, as of those which having been thought, i.e., for example, gathered together in the mind, are expressed in words. And that is really the art of communication, isn't it? It's putting an idea together, formulating it into words, and speaking one to another with the intent of the other person understanding what we're saying. Accordingly, gathered together in the mind, are expressed in words. Accordingly, a twofold use of the term is to be distinguished, one which relates to speaking and one which relates to thinking. And that makes perfect sense. Um, Paul says to be renewed in your mind. We need to renew our mind, our thoughts, our thoughts, put our thoughts in line with the word of God. Please turn off your television, please turn down your music, or turn it off, and dig into the Word and understand the Word of God. As relates to speech, and let me pull this up now, show all, as relates to speech, a word, yet not in the grammatical sense. The Logos is a word, yet not in the grammatical sense, equivalent to vocabulum the mere name of an object, but language. A word which, uttered by the living voice, embodies a conception or idea. Now just revisiting the idea that we ourselves have a Logos. I've scrolled down further in the entries of Logos to, uh, to Matthew 12. In, in which the Messiah says to us, But I say unto you, that every idle word that, man, that men shall speak, they shall give account, they shall give a logos thereof in the day of judgment. For, and this is the, the very next verse following, 36 and 37, For by thy words, for by your logos thou shalt be justified, and by your Logos you shall be condemned. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. So our Logos is very important. 
it very well should line up with the logos of God in order to be justified. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, you're liable to be found a liar. Now, just for example, if I say that Jesus is a man and that Joseph is his father, just as testified in the testimony, and you say that no, Jesus was born of a, born of a virgin by the Holy Spirit, then obviously both of us cannot be right. One of our logos is, is wrong, and we will be judged and given account for that in the judgment. If I say that the world is flat, and you say no, the world is a spinning globe, obviously both of us cannot be correct. One of us has an inc incorrect logos, and we will be justified or condemned depending on our logos and the truth in it. Now continuing, um, I'm going to leave Logos alone for one minute and visit something else right now and, to, and we will bring it all together in a little bit. So there's another word in English translated as the word in the Bible, but it doesn't come from the word Logos. There's another word that's related very closely to Logos, and that is the Greek word Rhema. So over here in Ephesians 6.17, we see... Uh, Paul's exhortation to the saints, he says, uh, after taking the shield and the um, and all the rest, uh, he says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, this word of God is not logos. This is the Greek word rhema. So, the sword of the Spirit is the rhema of God. And I'm going to click on that word rhema, which is G4487. Was that eight? Eight or three? G4487. Rhema. Rama. 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 I don't even know how to say it. I think it's rhema. Rhema it is a neutered noun where logos was a masculine noun. And. It is translated as word. It's used in the Bible 70 times. Translated as word 56 times. Saying, thing, no thing. So mainly it's translated as word. So it's um, another word which is translated as word. It, the outline of biblical usage, that which is or has been uttered by the living voice. Thing spoken, a word. Any sound produced by the voice and having definite meaning. This is the most important part any sound produced by the voice and having and and having definite meaning so it's not only a sound or a word but that word has definite meaning a speech discourse very similar a uh, description as that of logos but it is very uh, very well related to logos as well as we'll see in a second so there's a part that I'd like to look at here when we go down to Thayer's and we go down to the part where Ephesians was that we just quoted. It might take me a second to find. Hold on a second. Okay, so I found it. So actually up here in the Vines Expository Dictionary, if we click there and go to the entry, we scroll down to uh, Word and this paragraph right here. The significance of Rhema as distinct from Logos, is exemplified in the injunction to take the sword of the Spirit, the verse that we just read, which is the Word of God. So the significance of Rhema as distinct from Logos is exemplified in the injunction to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Here the reference is not to the whole Bible as such, but to the individual scripture which the Spirit brings to our remembrance for use in time of need, a prerequisite being the regular storing of the mind with Scripture. So the Logos, remember, is not only something spoken, but a thought that is in your head. And in specific uh, circumstances where you are in trouble or in need of a miracle or whatever, there are verses that you can articulate with your voice and call upon God Almighty to deliver you or bring about the desire that you desire in that particular situation. 
And this really exemplifies, it does a great job of explaining what the difference between Rhema and Logos. Think of it this way. Logos is the entire Word of God. The plan from A to Z. From Alpha to Omega is the Logos. Rhema is any particular part of that Logos. So in other words, a, a Logos contains Rhema, but a Rhema is not a Logos. And we can, well, let's take a look at, the, let's take a look at some examples. Let's go to the, the uh, biblical, let's go to the, uh, the use of the word Rhema in the scriptures. And we will see that every time that it is used, it is used in a particular situation and not not uh, relating to the entire plan of salvation, the entire plan of God, the entire word of God. But he answered, here we are in Matthew 4.4. 4. Here we have uh, Jesus being tempted by the devil after his baptism and his anointing. And he answered, and he's answering here the devil, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema, that proceedeth out of the mouth of, mouth of God. So, so Jesus is in a situation with the devil, and the devil quotes a scripture from the psalm, and the Messiah answers and says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, every rhema that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So every implies that there is more than one. So, this particular rhema that Jesus quotes back to the devil is that man shall not live by bread alone. He's not quoting the entire Logos of God. He's quoting one particular rhema. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema, but by every word, every part of the Logos that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Uh, next example, Matthew 5.11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of rhema against you falsely for my sake. So they are, there are men accusing you or me of whatever situation, and they are speaking a specific accusation against you. That is what a rhema is. It's in one particular in, uh, situation usually present right in front of you. It can be in the past also. Uh, Matthew twelve thirty six. But I say unto you that every idle word, every, again, every, so there's more than one, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account of thereof in the day of judgment. So, all right, on November 4th, 2011, you said this. Why don't you explain that to us? On, you know, April 13th, 2013, you said that. Why don't you explain that to us? So, it's one particular situation, and that's the difference between Rhema and Logos. And I think this is best exemplified, um, well, as I said, we're talking about communication. So, the New Testament is brought to us in the Greek language. And I think it's prudent that we go to the, uh, the Greeks themselves to understand what their language means. I'm going to go back to the uh, concordance page for... Logos, and I read this in the John 1, 1, 1, the John 1, 1 to 14 uh, video, and I think, let's go over it again. Note, and this is in the outline of biblical usage for the word Logos. Note, a Greek philosopher named Heraclitus first used the term Logos around 600 B.C. to designate the divine reason or plan which coordinates a changing universe. And I submitted in that video, and I maintain in this one, that that is the meaning and the definition of Logos. It designates the divine reason or plan which coordinates a changing universe. Even more interesting to me is when you go to the Wikipedia page for the entry of Rhema, uh, we see that Rhema in Greek, literally means an utterance or thing said in Greek. It is a word 
that signifies the action of utterance. It is an active, it is a verb-like word. In philosophy, it was used by both Plato and Aristotle. These are, you know, big Greek philosophers. They should know what a logos and a rhema is. And I think it best and prudent to understand how they used it and to see the intent of what those words mean. So let's go down here to uh, Greek philosophers. Both Plato, living in the middle of the, or living in the late 3rd and 4th century B.C., and Aristotle, after him, both of them used the terms logos, rhema, and anoma. So here's a new word for us, anoma. In Plato's usage, a logos, often translate, translatable as a sentence, is a sequence in which verbs are mingled with nouns, and every logos must have an anoma and a rhema. So a logos must have both an anoma and a rhema. For Plato, every logos was either true or false. And in a logos, names included rhema, which denotes actions, and anoma, a mark set on those who do the actions. Aristotle of Aristotle identified three components as central to the proposition, anoma, rhema, and logos. These terms are translated differently depending on the context of the discussion. Grammar or logic are the two contexts here. As in the table on the right, but it was only in the 12th century that grammarians began to think in terms of units we understand as subjects and predicates. So here's the box they're talking about, and this is a fascinating box to me. So Aristotle thought of a logos in two contexts, either logically oops, or grammatically. And either way, so when you look at it logically, what you have is a proposition or the idea, and that is the proposition is a logos. And the logos is grammatically uh, transmitted as a sentence. And within that sentence, you have a predicate and a subject. The rhema is the predicate. And in the predicate is the action part of it, the verb. And the subject of the proposition is the anoma. And that is the noun. And when you go to, I'm not going to pull it up, but if you go to the concordance, the Strong's concordance, anoma is translated, I believe, almost entirely as the word, as the English word name or surname. And it's really the meaning of a name. It's kind of important. Maybe we should look at it. But So uh, Jesus was named or a nomad. Uh, or when the child was born, he was a no, his anoma was Jesus. And he is the... Uh, in a logos, he would be the subject. The name or the noun is the subject in a logos, and the rhema is a verb in a logos. And I think there's a pretty good situation in the Bible where we can see the difference, or we can see uh, some clarification of this or some confirmation of this. So if we go to uh, back to logos... And we go back to the uh, entries where they're all used in the Bible. We scroll to the book of Mark. And we're going to visit the story of Jairus' daughter. And that's in Mark chapter 5. There we go. And let's see. Let's go to chapter 5. And this actually begins in verse 22. Maybe we should start there. Let me pull up the Strong's on it so we have it. So, verse 22, we have, oops, starting in verse 22, we have, And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name. Just curious now, is that a noma? Huh. How fun is that? That's a noma. So, by name. Name is 
Onoma in the Greek is translated as name in, in into English. Okay, so, and behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, Jairus by Onoma. And when he saw him, Jesus, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. So he's asking Jesus to come to his house, and to lay his hands on her, and to heal her, because she is at the point of death. He has complete faith in the Messiah's anointing and power. Or he is desperate and reaching out. Either way, he has faith that Jesus can do it. He surely wouldn't bow at his, fall at his feet and ask him if he didn't think he could do it. But in the meantime, well, and Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus... Uh, she came in the press behind and touched his garment, his garment being his uh, tzitzis. And she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. So the, another demonstration of faith. She believes that by touching his garment, she will be made whole. And she takes action. She takes a, a rhema. And straight away the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she fell in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done, she was not supposed to touch a rabbi, especially him, in her came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. So interesting that that story is interjected in the story of Jairus, but for a reason. We'll see that here in a minute. And while he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said so from jerry's house certain of the uh, certain of his servants came and they said and remember jerry is still with jesus at this point while he yet spake to the to the woman there came from the ruler of sin of the synagogue's house certain which said thy daughter is dead why troublest thou the master any further as soon as jesus heard the word that was spoken he said unto the ruler of the synagogue be not afraid, only believe. So I want to back up here to this. Uh, let's concentrate on this verse, uh, verse 36. So let's go to 35 one more time. While he yet spake to this daughter who he, he uh, cured of the issue of blood, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead, why troublest thou the master any further? And as soon as Jesus heard the logos that was spoken, as soon as Jesus heard the word, Geo 356, as soon as Jesus heard the Logos that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, he said to Jairus, Be not afraid, only believe. So, what Jesus heard was this Logos, this testimony, this idea that, the, that, the, that his daughter was dead. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, This is their Logos, Thy daughter is dead, why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the, the logos that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. So he heard a false logos. And he, ensure, he assured Jairus that this was not so. As, uh, and he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that weep and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why maketh ye this ado, and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. 
and they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father, Jairus, and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, Peter and James and John, and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years. And they were astonished with great astonishment, and he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. All right, so let me begin to wrap this up now. So many contend that Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is not the Word of God. Jesus preached the Word of God. Jesus was a product of the Word of God. Remember in the definition of Logos that it is the prophecies of the prophets. All the prophecies came to be fulfilled in the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth so that the scripture might be fulfilled. This came to pass to fulfill the scripture. And let's begin to see what Jesus says here. I'm back into the use of uh, Logos. In John 14, 24, he says, He that loves me not keeps not my Logos. And the Logos which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Remember, the Logos was God. And if we just go in reverse order here, John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my logos, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And John 12, 48, He that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him, the logos that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. Remember that our logos very much should line up with the logos of God. And as I've stated before and plainly spelled out by Peter in 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, we are all born again. You must be born again in order to enter into the kingdom of God. Being born again, not of a virgin, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible by the word, by the logos of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He was born again just as all of us are born again and begotten by the word for the word of God for the logos of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart have the word abiding in you, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. It is the spirit that quickeneth, or that makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. The words, the rhema, that I speak unto you, that Jesus speaks unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. The words, the rhema, that he speaks unto us, they are spirit, and they are life. And back into John's prologue. In him, in the word, was life, and the life was the light of men. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the rhema of God. Every bit of the word. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, 
command that these stones be made bread. But he, Jesus, answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word. Every word taken together becomes the Logos of God, the Word of God. I hope this video has been a blessing to you. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. May Jehovah be praised in Yehoshua's name.